we had a bread and butter and everything completely eaten that you could see it was rat marks and then we had the rats jump over the shoes as a matter of fact Angie was she's three year old now she was um, six or seven weeks old when one got into a cart Tony was only a year and a half I was out here making a bottle she was a uh, bottle fed and uh, as I made the bottle to take it in I keep them regular to feed because they sort of sleep right from nine o'clock at night till nearly six in the morning. I just made the feed and Tony wanted to go to the toilet so I brought him out here and put him on the popo. Being as a new baby he thought he'd never get back and we could hear this sucking and sucking. I took it for granted it was a baby sucking a thumb like you know sucking on the thumb. So I cut a hold of Tony's hand and I said mom we're going to the new baba. As we walked in the baby was still asleep the bottle, I was only after making the bottle a few minutes before that and leaving it propped on the body of the baby, like in the bed, so as it wouldn't spill. Mind it was a young rat, but it was very big. It was as big as the baby's bottle and a big long tail. I know that I just, that one scream and pushed little Tony back and I had to run round the cot and grab the baby out of the cot, which had a lot of these long gowns. And as it had got the fright, it had dropped the bottle, it had taken a whole piece out right off the nipple, and it dropped the bottle and it was running out of the cot because I had come past it and I sort of scared it that way and I got the other end to grab the baby out and as I was grabbing the baby out it caught onto the bottom of the baby's gown. I had to hit it off in hysterics. <laughs> A place to call home, and a decent place at that. For hours over the last few weeks, the politicians have talked about houses, the Labour Party, the Liberals, the Conservatives. And the Times has forecast that housing will be a big issue in the general election. To hear the politicians tell it, a decent place to live is always housing, in units of hundreds of thousands, and always governed by national finance and priorities. But to millions of people in Britain today, a decent place to live is home, and to them, it is their most desperate concern. To these millions, it matters little if home is in Stirling or Sheffield or Stepney. The home World in Action is invited to tonight is in Stepney. Well, to explain about the feeling in London, especially Stepney, I don't feel it right walking, I don't feel it safe walking in the streets. I would like to be able to go on a bicycle as I used to do before, even to go shopping, but I wouldn't really feel as safe as I did when I was back in Ireland. Of course, that was where we were reared and got quite used to. Our hostess in Stepney is Mrs Bradley. Her husband, Tom Bradley, is in the building trade, an unskilled painter. In work, he earns 11 or 12 pounds a week, but he's often out of work. That's the way the building trade goes. In particular, Ailey Street, I, I really feel deadly. It's like a black wall to me, or a blank wall, if you understand what I mean, if you were to be running away from someone, run up again a blank wall. That's what Ailey Street is to me, because I pass through it in fear. Like, when we first came here, there was prostitutes getting picked up, and we couldn't walk along, couldn't go to the doctors on my own without one of the children. It is ironical, to say the least, that the Bradleys live just across the street from Paradise. This is where we live. The rent is two pound two and six, and we pay it regular every Monday. My oldest son, Thomas, is 14 years of age since July, and the next is Edward. He'll be 13 in November. The next is Marie. She's 11-year-old in August. And Philomena was eight-year-old in August. Then there's Tony, he's four and a half. And then there's the baby, Angela. She's three-year-old last May. Another tenant is Mr. Bill Lewis. I live on the ground floor of number 70 Ailey Street. I pay three pounds, 10 a week rent. When I came here, I paid one month rent in advance. I couldn't move in for 11 weeks because the place was not in a fit state to live in and I had to redecorate it myself. On the first floor lived Mrs. Lily Coles, mother of eight. That's the room Lily Cole used to live in. 
And she could tell you a lot what happened to such a large family in that one room. It was like hell there in the one room with the whole lot of us. We didn't know what it was there to get do anything right. My health and all was gone in it. There was work all the time there when you'd be looking after the children, even if they were sick, there was no way of them getting well quick enough because they were in the one room and the other children wouldn't leave them alone because they'd be all on top of one another. So if one got a cold, they all got it. Mrs. Coles has been rehoused by Stepney Council, but she remembers. We had rats there. They were that bad. They used to come up the stairs and outside of my door on the landing. I'd have to look out through the keyhole to see was there any outside the door before I'd go out to get some water. And they were there while we'd done without the water after they were gone. Mrs. Coles talks of the nature of her escape. Oh, well, now, it's a bit, to tell the truth, I think it's a dream that I would I'll wake up some morning and find out I've got to go back to Ailey Street, which I wouldn't like to do, because if I'm only going that way for a message even, the children don't want to go near the hall where we were living, in case that they're going back up there to live. I want to give Andrew some. Give Andrew some. Me? Now, and then put the rest of the fill of now. We've been four years here, and when we first came here, we had water come right through here, and come right through here. And it poured and poured down. We had to have sacks and buckets and baths, everything for to soak it up. When we sent for the landlord, he merely told us that there was nothing he could do. We'd have to wait until he could get somebody. He couldn't get a proper builder for to do it. We had a chap come up here looking for him, and when we had a chat with him on the stairs telling him where to find the landlord, he said, the landlord won't pay the proper money, he said. So it was nearly about eight or nine months before we really got it done. Consider the Bradley's condition. Eight people sleeping in two rooms. For them, how did it all begin? Well, we were born in Dublin, and we were raised in Dublin until the war started. And my husband first came over here, and then he came to join the RAF, and I joined up about four or five months later. After we were married, we were in Wolverhampton for um, several, nearly eight, between five and eight years. And uh, I lost my first baby there. Then eventually we came to London in 58, and we first started off in, in a rest centre. We walked the streets after being disappointed after a flat my husband was after. And we were in the rest centre five or six weeks before Tony was born. Then after Tony was born, he went into hospital where he took pneumonia when he was five weeks old. It was a matter of fact, it was on Boxing Day. And uh, they took him in with uh, double pneumonia and bronchitis in the London hospital. And a couple of months after, in, a couple of weeks after, it was in the January, we fell lucky in getting a, a one-room place downstairs in this house. Well, we moved in on the January, and we were a matter of about five or six weeks in, and we couldn't understand the banging of the doors underneath. Then we discovered that it was up to three and four in the morning, and Mr Bradley went down the stairs one morning, he stayed in the corner, the light in the dark, and uh, he discovered that it was three or four girls working on the ground floor, prostitutes, I should say. And the men was going in back and forward, coloreds, Indians, all types. All we could hear was the hall door banging. But we, we were the room underneath, uh, over it rather. The children was getting awake and going back to sleep and so on. So we mentioned to the landlord and he said, no, that we were wrong. However, the man that was downstairs, he used to come regular about 12 o'clock every day, and the man that was there, he came and asked me once, would I scrub out there? I asked Mr Bradley, would I do it? And he said, no, you'll do no such a thing. He said, you know what's going on. I said, well, the man just asked me a question, so I more or less thought I'd ask you. However, it turned out that um, the police was round inquiring. They asked me to help them to catch these people, that they couldn't get the man that was running these girls, if you understand. So uh, it was run about three or four months before they got them convicted and they got them out. The landlord was taking nearly 15 pound a week 
and, and was marking on a rent book about four pound and he used to mark the rent book about once every five or six weeks for them. I heard them arguing over it and uh, I was there several times, happened to come down the stairs on my way out with the children in the hall, putting them in the pram and that and I'd have to wait and the door would be open and I'd see them paying them out so much and say I'm taking them regular every week, they got, you got 15 pound or if not 20 pound. I couldn't allow the boys out or the girls out. Actually, there was no pr proper place for them to play. And if they did go to play around the corner, the people around the corner sent them away telling them to come around their own place. And the front of the street being so busy with traffic, that we couldn't let them play. And then we couldn't let them stay in and out of the house because of the rats in the house. So, more or less, the front bedroom has been their playground, although we've got good furniture in it, decent furniture in it. They've had to play on the beds most of the time. This is Tom Bradley. If you ask Tom Bradley where he lives, he'll say in the city of London. And as everyone knows, the city is rich. Mr. Bradley is not. I'm over here as a labourer. And I got some good jobs. But uh, as curtains, I was working. I did work as hard as I could. And I still am inca I'm capable of working just twice as hard. But it was all through redundancy I was knocked off. Mr. Bradley was something of a sportsman once. I had a trial with Wolverhampton Wanderers before Ted Vizard left. I had a, tri a trial with Walsall. I was playing for Bilston and I got paid for it. But it wasn't very much. I was asked to go to Hull City and Reg Barlow, West Bromwich Albion introduced me. But uh, it didn't, didn't materialize really. Many of his neighbors say, well, if it's so bad here, why not go back to Dublin? Went back to Dublin after I left the RAF and I made an application to my father's employer to get a job. I received an answer telling me to report for a medical examination, in which I did. I was halfway through my medical examination, and the doctor asked me what forces I was in. I told him I was in the British Royal Air Force. He carried on with his medical examination, and as I was finished, he told me I had failed the examination. Well. The reason why, uh, why I think I failed is because I served in the, served in the British Royal Air Force. Ways of escape from Stepney are few, but one way is to punch your way out. Then Eddie picked up, took up boxing. Actually, it was young Thomas tried to start it because he was very bad with his nerves, and the doctor said the only way to get him out of it was put him at boxing. Bags coming towards you, jumping quick with a foot. Then when Thomas didn't check up the box and Eddie automatically took it up, which he's got little prizes and so on. Well, as far as work is concerned, I'd like my boys to go as they wish. I mean, I have a boy, he's very, very intelligent. He wants to be an electric engineer. And my other son wants to be a carpenter. Well, I wouldn't advise my son to go into the building trade. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the same predicament as what I'm in at the very moment. The intelligent boy he talks of is his eldest son, Tommy. And we put young Thomas at the accordion, because we couldn't get a piano up the stairs in here. And the piano would be very expensive. So we knew a small accordion wouldn't be so expensive. My sister went half in the deposit, and she still goes half in like one six or eight weeks' money. She pays it in the next six or eight weeks' money, I, if I can afford it. If I can't, she helps out and pays that one.
the husband in and out of work, Mrs. Bradley's concern is not with what her children will do in the future, but what they will eat now. Well, I cut out an uh, extra, something like now, the kids come home from school and they might have sausage and beans and chips. For, for One might have that. The other chap might have, the other boy might have bacon and egg and um, spaghetti. But that again, they might have tomatoes. Well, we only have tomatoes and onions and cheese and the uh, spread cheese and cheddar cheese. And we make sandwiches out like sort of fills them at evening time, like supper time, as well as drinking chocolate. Well, all that's cut out. There's no drinking chocolate. We have to cut out the extra flakes in the mornings, more or less the flakes it's got for the smaller children. Young Thomas and Eddie will just have maybe have fry bread and a couple of mugs of tea going to school, maybe just tea and bread and butter off to school. And um, the flakes are, or if it's Rice Krispies or that, it goes for the others. If there isn't enough, it's just put down for the smaller ones and the big ones have to go without. Where exactly does Mrs. Bradley's weekly money go? Well, I start off like similar to this morning. I went out and I bought bacon, eggs, tea, well, not all in the tea, I just got a half pound because that takes too much like carrying all back together. My meat alone runs about three pound ten. Uh, starting off with Sunday, as I say, the chicken, and then I get a, a leg of roast or a piece of bacon, maybe run about eight bob, maybe ten bob. Well, what I have, I sort of boil cabbage in the same water as the bacon is boiled in, because um, most of the family is not keen on peas, although they will have a little bit of peas. And, um, Spuds, I have to get uh, ten pound of spuds for Sunday, a uh, ten pound of spuds for Saturday. During the week, they only run me six pound because I do chips for the children and they have school dinner, as you say. My mother and father sleep in a bedroom with four children. Our names are Maria Bradley, Philomena Bradley. Tony Bradley and Angela Bradley. Thomas and Eddie sleeps outside in a putchua. We hear the traffic when the whole four of us are going to bed. And in the morning, I am the first awake. It's the only one has to be washed three and four times a day. It's so difficult to keep them clean here, even for to get them battered. On a Saturday here, we have a job trying to bath the hair and give them a proper wash. Tony in particular has to be scrubbed, not washed, from the stairs and the debris where they play. Do you want to wash your hands? And I'll wash your hands. I'll move back, move back. Thanks. We have to scrub them every time. Um, what have the Bradleys done to get out of their obviously awful home? Have they tried? Yeah. I, did, I did try to get a mortgage from Barry's estate agency in Hendon Centre. But they were asking a very high price in which I couldn't provide. How much? They were asking £300, actually. Well, I first wrote up to agents, and when I wrote, the thing was always the same because uh, they seemed to want a deposit. And the mortgages, they couldn't supply us with a mortgage because of Tommy not being in constant work. What are the Bradley's chances of financing a new home? Roy Brooks, the estate agent, explains. Of course, I can't help these people. <clears throat> Building societies can't or won't. Building societies won't look at you if you earn under 20 quid a week. The building societies in this country don't build houses, you know. We've tried very hard as regards to trying for places. I have the papers, letters. I wrote to everybody as, as far as trying to get a place. And even when this notice to quit come along, I tried everywhere possible. I tried all the different buildings, uh, house agencies and so on. Everyone, the minute we mentioned we had six children, we were put completely down. What chance, if any, do the Bradleys have of getting a council house? Councillor Edith Ramsey of Stepney. This family has 44 points. The others, some of them have more than 50. And in Frank, 
In fact, I don't see any likelihood of any of those 132, and there are many others who aren't on the housing list, being rehoused because all accommodation is required for people who must be rehoused because they live in clearance areas which are be, their homes are to be demolished and they must be given a place to live in. Not only do the Bradleys have little or no chance of getting something else, there's a constant threat over their existing home. Well, it came in the morning by registered post and it was rather a shock really. When I opened it, I didn't exactly know what to think as I read it. And then I did get a bit upset, although I didn't say anything to the kiddies because Tommy was at work. And when he came in on the dinner time, I just put the letter down in front of him. And he said, register letter for me. I said, no, for both of us. So he looked at it. Before he looked at it, he said, I suppose I've won the pools. I said, no, you haven't won the pools. It was, of course, what is known in Stepney and other such areas as the paper. The landlord's notice to quit. Its arrival at number 70 Ailey Street made the Bradleys face again the prospect of the community home. Well, to go back to the rest centre would be the last of my dreams, you might say. I had in mind from desperation, thinking, and many of the nights I've lay away thinking. I've thought many a way out of perhaps gas and the kids and myself. And then I thought to myself, perhaps I must be going loony with worry. I, I didn't like it at all. As a matter of fact, I don't know how I let my little family go in there. Otherwise, just for uh, the night. But she, they stopped there for five weeks. The Bradleys' final hope officially lies with the courts. On Friday the 13th of September, they only went to appeal against the notice to quit. Unofficially, hope resides only in action groups, in the tenants' associations. Well, three and a half years ago, uh, a new landlord took over the this property and he charged he tried to charge us an exorbitant rent an increase of one pound seventeen or six a week on the present rent the, ten the tenants were determined not to pay they were shocked with such an increase uh, they formed a tenants association with a main aim of not paying this exorbitant rent they were issued with notice to quit but they still did not deter and they still decided to carry on and fight the case and eventually the land the uh, borough council the Bethnal Green borough council place a compulsory purchase order on these properties, the first one under Mr. Brooks's circular. I think it's an interesting point that at the time when he charged this increase in rent, there was no such circular and there was no protection whatsoever for decontrolled tenants. But these, these tenants decided to fall together and stand as one, one group to fight this increase. But even action by such associations can offer the Bradleys little encouragement, as Councillor Ramsey explained. People don't understand what it is to live without any hope of getting anything better. Overcrowded, insanitary conditions, with no chance of a family life. Nor can they do anything at all. A few people do manage to put down a deposit and buy a house. But where are the houses to buy? They're at fabulous rents, even if they're obtainable. That's it. You simply wait. You wait on a list. Come the time to quit, what can the Bradleys expect? Thomas Farr, who has fought many evictions, explains. Well, uh, uh, it all depends uh, uh, on your length of uh, resistance to what we people call injustice. Uh, on the first occasion, for instance, uh, the police might deal with you quite fairly and regard you just as a sort of a first timer in these affairs, like when you uh, conduct yourself, say, in a peace movement, tenant struggles. But if you, you persist in uh, trying to overcome what we call moral injustice, then you very soon find that uh, you're up against it really and uh, you, you need to take every precaution to see to it that, uh, that you're dealt with fairly uh, and in accordance with the law as it stands. As the law does stand, how strong is it on the tenant's behalf? A lawyer experienced in property cases explains. And while there aren't enough houses and flats to go around, then plainly there must be abuses. Of course, the law can in intervene to assist and ameliorate the worst parts of the abuses. For example, by restoring control, by giving powers back to the rent tribunals. But in my opinion, and it is only a personal opinion, I don't think myself that until we have enough houses in this country to go around, the law can do very much to prevent effectually abuses of tenants. The bread came out with one crumb of comfort. Instead of having to quit in 28 days, they were given a stay of eight weeks. But tonight, five and a half of those eight weeks have gone. And one has the fear 
that they are almost back where they started. As we walked in, the baby was still asleep. The bottle, I was only after making the bottle a few minutes before that, and leaving it propped on the body of the baby, like in the bed, so as it wouldn't spill. Mind it was a young rat, but it was fairly big. It was as big as the baby's bottle and a big long tail. 